This is the recording for the practice test seven, electricity and electric circuits. And the first couple of questions. I took this quote here from Wikipedia, which talks about electromagnetic forces. There are four fundamental forces in nature. One of them is electromagnetic, another one is gravitation. And then the other two are the strong and the weak nuclear forces. The last two, you only will find them on a microscopic level, but the other two, electromagnetic and gravitation, you'll find at a microscopic and at a macroscopic level. And in our everyday world, pretty much all the forces, see here I'm supplying a an explanation of what you find on Wikipedia, all the forces are based on electricity, electromagnetism, unless you can clearly identify them as a gravitational force. I'm going to get that actually out of the way first. There are two questions here. So the gravitational force obviously is gravitational there and there. The tidal force, which is the force from the moon and the sun, is based on gravitation as well. And then I'm going to give these away here. I really just give them away. Strong binding force is the strong nuclear force. There it is. And the weak nuclear force is the weak nuclear force. So that means all the rest here that you find are electrical or magnet, electromagnetic in, by nature in nature and by nature. So on a microscopic level, chemical reactions are electrical binding atoms together to form molecules, keeping electrons within the atom is all electrical. And on a microscopic level, all these forces that we encounter in everyday life, friction and air resistance, tension and elastic force, cohesion, surface tension, adhesion, capillary action, so the support force, magnetism, buoyancy and static lift, and aerodynamic lift are all based on the interaction between negative electrons and other negative electrons, negative electrons and positive atomic nuclei, atomic nu positive atomic nuclei and positive atomic nuclei. All these interactions that are, mi are based on, on the interaction between these on a microscopic level. So all the forces that we encounter in our everyday lives are ultimately based on electromagnetism, the interaction on a microscopic level between, as I said, electrons among each other, electrons with atomic nuclei, and so on. And so on isn't a whole lot. It's just these few, with the exception, again, of gravity. Gravity, when something falls off the table, that's definitely gravitation. When we see the tides go out or tides come in, that's definitely gravitation. So those are the two exceptions in our everyday world. All right, going away from that, question three. These let's see, are in a certain order, so let's look at them. Conductors have a low electric resistance. Insulators have a high electric resistance. Semiconductors sometimes behave like conductors and sometimes like insulators. A transistor is, a, is an example of a semiconductor. I'm really not covering it in this course, but I figured I'll just put it in here. Superconductors are noted for their absence of electric resistance. Capacitors are used for storing electric energy and resistors are typically used for elec using electric energy and or for limiting the electric current. So they have two purposes depending on where you put them. If you encounter them in an electric um, circuit or if they are actually the main part of an electrical device. All right, these questions here, there are a few questions um, starting with number four. They should be on the homework, but at some point I just had too much stuff in the homework, so I put them on the practice test here. So they just go directly with the books or experiments from the book. I'm not sure if I have actually um, a video for that. But if you comb your hair and the comb becomes positively charged, then your hair obviously becomes negatively charged. And then I wrote a little bit more here that I'd like to read through. After rubbing the balloon against the woolen sweater against your hair, it will stick to a wall if the balloon is charged, well, positively or negatively. Well, either way, will work. 
And then again, you will find the explanation in the book. A rubbed comb or plastic spoon held near the water stream of a faucet attracts the water. Make sure, if, if you try that, it's very easy to do. If you try that, make sure not to hold it into the water. Make sure that, you, that it, that's not touching the water, but just near it. Suspend a ping pong ball with a string and cover it with aluminum foil. Then rub a comb or plastic spoon and get it very near the ball. The aluminum ball will be, let's see, attracted toward the plastic spoon or the, uh, towards, a to, towards a plastic spoon or comb. There it is. So let's see. Let me just see if that's, if those two have the same one. Erupt, erupt. A coma plastic spoon helped near the water streaming out of, out of a faucet. Oh, oh, the grammar didn't work with this one. Oh, yeah, it attracts the water. Okay, that one is correct. So here I, oh, here I chose the wrong one. There we go. I said it correctly. Suspend a ping pong ball with a string covered with aluminum. Then the aluminum ball will be attracted toward the coma and plastic spoon. And then for some odd reason, I just chose the wrong letter there for a moment. Drop small bits of paper, rub a comb, and get it close to the paper pieces. The comb will attract the pieces of paper. So this one here. Take laundry out of the dryer, and you notice some clothes cling together. As you pull them apart, you hear crackling noises. Let's see where that one is, a faint crackling noise. And if you do it in dark, you can actually see discharges. Okay, question five. The experiment described in the question above work only because the materials used are insulators, with the exception of the aluminum covered ping pong ball. So that's why these experiments work. Okay, the next question then is, oh, hold on, hold on. If these materials were conductors, the experiments described above would not work because charges would readily flow away upon contact. That's why the only conductor, the aluminum covered ping pong ball, is suspended by a string. Right, and now the next question are actually the explanations. And this is where you go back to the book and you will find the explanation for these. The comb and hair experiment described above works due to charging by friction. So that's the wool and sweater and the balloon. As you rub them against each other, well, it's friction. The balloon and wall part, so once you actually stick it there, there's actually both of them are insulators. There are actually no charges flowing, and you actually don't rub it. You just put it there. That one is actually charged by polarization. And again, you can look that up in the book that that's the case. The comb, plastic spoon, and water experiment described works, works due to the same effect, even though I did find a video by a physicist online who says otherwise that actually there is more stuff going on than just the polarization of water molecules. The aluminum covered ping pong ball described above works due to charging by induction. So I believe there was B here. And by the way, when you look at the book, only these three apply. All the other four here have nothing to do with these experiments. The common piece of paper experiment described above, well, works due to friction again. Oh, whoa, 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 I take that back, polarization. The clothes from the dry experiment described above works due to friction. There you go. All right, next one. Okay, totally changing gears. So the above here was about electricity in general, but this one is about electric circuits. So let's see, you should be familiar by now with the electric circuits and what's happening there. Compared to a single resistance connected to a battery, two or more resistance connected in parallel to the same battery will combine to a smaller total equivalent resistance and consequently draw a larger total current. Compared to a single lamp connected to a battery, two lamps connected in parallel to the same battery will draw more current. As more lamps are put into a parallel circuit, the overall power increases. 
that makes sense. The more limbs you turn on and then your household, they're all connected in parallel. So the more lamps you put on, the more your energy bill will go up. So yes, the overall power increases. Although the lamps in parallel get more current, they also have to share it with each lamp drawing the equivalent current compared to a single lamp. Thus, each will glow just as bright as a single lamp. Which is good. You can turn on the other lamps in your household and they all glow at the same you know, there's, there's no difference. I mean, if they're identical lamps, they will all glow at the same power. If one of the lamps apparently burns out, the remaining lamps will stay on, which is the good part. Of, that's why everything continues to glow. That's why everything in a household is wired in parallel. You can't just wire them in series with each other because then if you turn off the blender, your TV goes out. Well, that's not... that's not what they're about. So they have to be all wired in parallel to each other. Same thing with the lamps. Match the following. All right. So here you have to apply Ohm's law. So the current through 5 ohm resistor, 120 volt power supply. So 120 volts divided by 5 ohms is 24 amps. 10 ohms, 6 amps. So 10 ohms times 6 amps is 60 volts. And 20 volts divided by 2 amps is 10 ohms. All right, so here you combine resistances. When four identical 20 ohm resistors are connected in series, the combined resistance simply adds up to 20 added four times, so 80 ohms. When four identical 80 ohm resistors are connected in parallel, their combined resistance is going to be less than the smallest one. If you calculate this out, you will come up with 20 ohms. This one is actually, you use the equation of the reciprocals as you add them. In this case, it becomes a little bit easier because they're identical, so you could actually just divide 80 by 4. But if you do it the proper way, 1 plus 80 plus 1 plus 80, I'm sorry, no, I said that wrong. 1 divided by 80 plus 1 divided by 80 and so on, and then take your reciprocal again, you will come up with 20 ohms. Here, you have to do it anyway. So you have to calculate 1 over 540 plus 1 over 720. Hit the Enter button. You will come up with 0 0.032. That is not the end result, but you get it on your calculator. But notice I didn't put ohms there. So this can't be the correct thing anyway. So anyway, if you do this, 1 over 540 plus 1 over 720, you will get 0 0.0032 something. But then you have to remember that you have to invert it again. So you have to take the reciprocal of that, and you will come up with 310 on your calculator, and that would be the resistance 310 ohms. And just as a reminder, in a parallel circuit, the equivalent resistance is always smaller than the smallest resistance. So this is the correct answer. All right, let's see what we got here. The electric power of a lamp that carries 3 amps, 120 volts. So this one apparently must be about the power law. So 3 amps times 120 volts is 360 watts. Oops, there it is. 40 watt light bulb connected to 120 volts source. The current in the light bulb is going to be 40 watts divided by 120 volts, which is 0.33 amps. 0.7 amp current flows to the light bulb, 120 volt outlet. The power consumed is 0.7 times 120, which is 84. Power dissipated in the form resistor. Okay, this is a little bit harder. You first actually have to use Ohm's law. So you have to use two equations, Ohm's law and then, then the power law. So when you multiply these two here, we, you will come up with 36 volts. And now you multiply the 36 volts for the power law with 9 amps, so that's going to come up to around at 320 watts. Uh, again, you have to use Ohm's law first. 4 ohms times 9 amps is 36 volts. Then use the power law of 36 volts times 9 is 324, rounded to 320 because of two significant figures. 
power line with a resistance. Notice these are almost the same numbers, except this one is 90 amps. And so because this one is 10 times larger, but the current will flow into the flow into the equation twice. That's why the correct answer will be 32,000 watts. And here it is. So again, Ohm's law. 4 ohms times 90 amps is 360 volts. Then 360 volts times 90 amps is 32,400 watts, which then is rounded, rounded as such. Right, electric heater is rated at 400 watts when used in a 110 volt circuit. The safety fuse in the circuit can handle 15 amps of current. So 400 watts divided by 110 volts means that the electric heater gets a neighborhood of 3.6, let's see, 400 divided by 110, yeah, 3.64 amps. Then you plug in a second heater in, well, that increases the current. So you can plug in a total of four, there it is, four or less, such heaters because 4 times 3.6 is going to be in the neighborhood of 14.4 amps and then you're within the 15 amps. All right, positive charge and negative charge help each other released as they move. The force on each particle increases and increases because they're getting closer. And then the rest of the questions, those are actually the calculation problems, which you do have in another video, and you have it in the worked out problems as well. And that was the collaborate recording for the Unit 7 practice test.